Section 16 from Satirical and Humorous Poems, Part 1, by Thomas Moore. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian. From the Skeptic As the gay tint that decks the vernal rose, Not in the flower, but in our vision glows, as the ripe flavour of Falernia tides, Not in the wine, but in our taste resides. So when, with heartfelt tribute, we declare That Marco's honest, and that Susan's fair, Tis in our minds, and not in Susan's eyes, Or Marco's life, the worth or beauty lies. For she, in flat-nosed china, would appear as plain a thing as Lady Anne is here. And one light joke at rich Loretto's dome would rank good Marco with the damned at Rome. There's no deformity so vile, so base, that tis not somewhere thought a charm, a grace. No foul reproach that may not steal a beam From other sons to bleach it to esteem. Ask who is wise. You'll find the selfsame man, a sage in France, A madman in Japan. And here some head beneath a mitre swells, Which there had tingled to a cap and bells. Nay, there may yet some monstrous region be, Unknown to Cook and from Napoleon free, Where Castlereagh would for a patriot pass, And mouthing Musgrave scarce be deemed an ass. End of poem. The Twopenny Post Bag Letter 2 From Colonel McMahon to Gould Francis Lecky, Esquire Dear Sir, I've just had time to look into your very learned book, wherein, as plain as man can speak, whose English is half modern Greek, you prove that we can ne'er entrench our happy isles against the French, till royalty in England's made a much more independent trade. In short, until the house of Guelph lays lords and commons on the shelf, and boldly sets up for itself. All that can well be understood in this said book is vastly good, and as to what's incomprehensible, I dare be sworn tis full as sensible. But to your work's immortal credit, the prince, good sir, the prince has read it. The only book himself remarks, which he has read since Mrs. Clark's. Last levee morn he looked it through, during that awful hour or two of grave tonsorial preparation, which to a fond admiring nation sends forth, announced by trump and drum, the best Whig prince in Christendom. He thinks with you the imagination of partnership in legislation could only enter in the noddles of dull and ledger-keeping twaddles whose heads on firms are running so, they even must have a king and co. And hence most eloquently show forth on checks and balances and so forth. But now he trusts we're coming nearer, far more royal, loyal era, when England's monarch need but say, Whip me those scoundrels, Castlereagh, or hang me up those papists, Eldon, and twill be done. Ay, faith, and well done. With view to which I've this command To beg, sir, from your travelled hand, Round which the foreign graces swarm, A plan of radical reform, Compiled and chosen as best you can In Turkey or at Isfahan, And quite upturning branch and root, Lords, commons, and burdet to boot, but pray, what ear you may impart, write somewhat more brief than Major Cartwright. Else, though the prince be long in rigging, twould take at least a fortnight's wigging, two wigs to every paragraph, before he well could get through half. You'll send it also speedily, as truth to say, twixt you and me, his highness, heated by your work, already thinks himself Grand Turk. 
and you'd have laughed had you seen how he scared the chancellor just now when on his lordship's entering poofty slapped his back and called him mufti the tailors too have got commands to put directly into hands all sorts of dulimans and pouches with sashes turbans and pabuches while yarmouth sketching out a plan of new moustaches a la ottoman and all things fitting and expedient to turkify our gracious regent you therefore have no time to waste so send your system yours in haste End of poem. Extracts from the Diary of a Politician Wednesday Through Manchester Square took a canter just now, Met the old yellow chariot and made a low bow. This I did, of course, thinking t'was loyal and civil, But got such a look, oh, t'was black as the devil, How unlucky, in cog he was travelling about and i like a noodle must go find him out memo when next by the old yellow chariot i ride to remember there is nothing princely inside thursday at lebe to-day made another sad blunder what can be come over me lately i wonder the prince was as cheerful as if all his life he had never been troubled with friends or a wife fine weather says he to which i who must prate answered yes sir but changeable rather of late he took it i fear for he looked somewhat gruff and handled his new pair of whiskers so rough that before all courtiers i feared they'd come off and then lord how jerram would triumphantly scoff memo to buy for son dicky some unguent or lotion to nourish his whiskers sure road to promotion saturday last night a concert vastly gay given by lady castlereagh my lord loves music and we know has two strings always to his bow in choosing songs the regent named had i a heart for falsehood framed while gentle hartford begged and prayed for young i am and sore afraid end of poem what's my thought like question why is a pump like viscount castlereagh answer because it is a slender thing of wood that up and down its awkward arm doth sway and coolly spout and spout and spout away in one week washy everlasting flood end of poem epigram dialogue between a dowager and her maid on the night of lord yarmouth's fate i want the court guide said my lady to look if the house seymour place be at thirty or twenty we've lost the court guide ma'am but here's the red book where you'll find, I dare say, see more places in plenty. End of poem. Little Man and Little Soul A Ballad To the tune of There was a little man, and he wooed a little maid. Dedicated to the Right Honourable Charles Abbott. Arcanas Ambo e Cantare Pares 1813 there was a little man and he had a little soul and he said little soul let us try 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 whether it's within our reach to make up a little speech just between you and little i i i just between little you and little i then said his little soul peeping from her little hole i protest little man you are stout 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 but if it's not uncivil pray tell me what the devil must our little little speech be about bout bout must our little little speech be about the little man looked big with the assistance of his wig and he called his little soul to order 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 till she feared he'd make her jog in to jail like thomas croggin 
as she wasn't duke or earl to reward her ward her ward her as she wasn't duke or earl to reward her the little man then spoke little soul it is no joke for as sure as jacky fuller loves a sup 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 i will tell the prince and people what i think of church and steeple and my little patent plan to prop them up 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 and my little patent plan to prop them up away then cheek by jowl little man and little soul went and spoke their little speech to a tittle 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 and the world all declare that this priggish little pair never yet in all their lives looked so little 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 never yet in all their lives looked so little end of poem reinforcements for lord wellington suosque tibi commendat troja penates hos cape fatorum comites virgil eighteen thirteen as recruits in these times are not easily got and the marshal must have them pray why should we not as the last and i grant it the worst of our loans to him ship off the ministry body and bones to him there's not in all england i'll venture to swear any men we could half so conveniently spare and though they've been helping the french for years past we may thus make them useful to england at last castlereagh in our sieges might save some disgraces being used to the taking and keeping of places and volunteer canning still ready for joining might show off his talents for sly undermining could the household but spare us its glory and pride old headford at horn's work again might be tried and as chief justice make a bold charge at his side while van sittart could victual the troops upon tick and the doctor look after the baggage and sick nay i do not see why the great regent himself should in times such as these stay at home on the shelf though through narrow defiles he's not fitted to pass yet who could resist if he bore down our mass and though oft of an evening perhaps he might prove like our spanish confederates unable to move yet there's one thing in war of advantage unbounded which is that he could not with ease be surrounded in my next i shall sing of their arms and equipment at present no more but good luck to the shipment end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 17 from Satirical and Humorous Poems, Part 2, The Fudge Family in Paris, by Thomas Moore. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian. From Miss Biddy Fudge to Miss Dorothy, of Clonkilty in Ireland. Amiens. Dear Doll, while the tails of our horses are plaiting, the trunks tying on and papa at the door into very bad french is as usual translating his english resolve not to give a sou more i sit down to write you a line only think a letter from france with french pens and french ink how delightful though would you believe it my dear i have seen nothing yet very wonderful here no adventure no sentiment far as we've come but the cornfields and trees quite as dull as at home and but for the postboy his boots and his queue i might just as well be at clonkilty with you in vain at desaines did i take from my trunk that divine fellow stern and fall reading the monk in vain did i think of his charming dead ass and remember the crust and the wallet alas no monks can be had now for love or for money all owing pa says to that infidel bony and though one little neddy we saw in our drive out of classical nampont the beast was alive by the by though at calais 
papa had a touch of romance on the pier which affected me much at the sight of that spot where our darling de Zuit set the first of his own dear legitimate feet modelled out so exactly and god bless the mark tis a foot dolly worthy so grand a monarch he exclaimed oh mon roi and with tear-dropping eye stood to gaze on the spot while some jacobin nigh muttered out with a shrug what an insolent thing ma foi he be right tis the englishman's king and that gros pied de cochon beggar me will say that de foot look much better if turned tod away there's the pillar too lord i had nearly forgot what a charming idea raised close to the spot the mode being now as you've heard i suppose to build tombs over legs and raise pillars to toes this is all that's occurred sentimental as yet except indeed some little flower nymphs we've met who disturb one's romance with pecuniary views flinging flowers in your path and then bawling for sous and some picturesque beggars whose multitudes seem to recall the good days of the ancien regime all as ragged and brisk you'll be happy to learn and as thin as they were in the time of dear stern end of poem from phil fudge esq to the lord viscount castlereagh paris at length my lord i have the bliss to date to you a line from this demoralized metropolis where by plebeians low and scurvy the throne was turned quite topsy-turvy and kingship tumbled from its seat stood prostrate at the people's feet where still to use your lordship's tropes the level of obedience slopes upward and downward as the stream of hydra faction kicks the beam where the poor palace changes masters quicker than a snake its skin and louis is rolled out on casters while bone is born on shoulders in but where in every change no doubt one special good your lordship traces that tis the kings alone turned out the ministers still keep their places how oft dear viscount castlereagh i've thought of thee upon the way as in my job what place could be more apt to wake a thought of thee or often afar when gravely sitting upon my dicky as is fitting for him who writes a tour that he may more of men and manners see i've thought of thee and of thy glories thou guest of kings and king of tories reflecting how thy fame has grown and spread beyond man's usual share at home abroad till thou art known like major semple everywhere and marvelling with what powers of breath your lordship having speech to death some hundreds of your fellow-men next speech to sovereign's ears and when all sovereigns else were dozed at last speech down the sovereign of belfast oh mid the praises and the trophies thou gainst from morris of st sophie's mid all the tributes to thy fame there's one thou shouldst be chiefly pleased at that ireland gives her snuff thy name and castlereagh's the thing now sneezed at end of poem ireland's revenge o oh, england could such poor revenge atone for wrongs that well might claim the deadliest one were it a vengeance sweet enough to sate the wretch who flies from thy intolerant hate to hear his curses on such barbarous sway echoed where e'er he bends his cheerless way could this content him every lip he meets teems for his vengeance with such poisonous sweets were this his luxury 
never is thy name pronounced but he doth banquet on thy shame here's maledictions ring from every side upon that grasping power that selfish pride which vaunts its own and scorns all rights beside that low and desperate envy which to blast a neighbour's blessings risks the few thou hast that monster self too gross to be concealed which ever lurks behind thy proffered shield that faithless craft which in thy hour of need can court the slave can swear he shall be freed yet basely spurns him when thy point is gained back to his masters ready gagged and chained were the associate of that band of kings that royal ravening flock whose vampire wings o'er sleeping europe treacherously brood and fan her into dreams of promised good of hope of freedom but to drain her blood if thus to hear thee branded be a bliss that vengeance loves there's yet more sweet than this that twas an irish head an irish heart made thee the fallen and tarnished thing thou art that as the centaur gives the infected vest in which he died to rack his conqueror's breast we send thee castlereagh as heaps of dead have slain their slayers by the pest they spread so hath our land breathed out thy fame to dim the strength to waste and rot thee soul and limb so hath our land breathed out thy fame to dim thy strength to waste and rot thee soul and limb her worst infections all condensed in him End of poem. Phil Fudge in Paris. But think, Dick, their cooks, what a loss to mankind, what a void in the world would their art leave behind, their chronometer spits, their intense salamanders, their ovens, their pots that can soften old ganders, all vanished for ever, their miracles o'er and the marmot perpetual bubbling no more forbid it forbid it ye holy allies take whatever ye fancy take statues take money but leave them oh leave them their perigo pies their glorious goose livers their high pickled tunny though many i own are the evils they've brought us though royalties here on her very last legs yet who can help loving the land that has taught us six hundred and eighty-five ways to dress eggs you see dick in spite of their cries of god damn coquin anglais etc how generous i am and now to return once again to my day which will take us all night to get through in this way from the boulevards we saunter through many a street crack jokes on the natives mine all very neat leave the signs of the times to political fops and find twice as much fun in the signs of the shops here a louis dix-huit there a martin mascoose much in vogue since your eagles are gone out of use Henri quarters in shoals and gods a great many but saints are the most on hard duty of any saint tony who used all temptations to spurn here hangs o'er a beer shop and tempts in his turn while there st venetia sits hemming and frilling her holy mouchoir o'er the door of some milliner st austin's the outward and visible sign of an inward cheap dinner and pint of small wine while st denis hangs o'er some hatter of ton and possessing good bishop no head of his own takes an interest in dandies who've got next to none then we stare into shops read the evening's affiches or if some who are lotharios in feeding should wish 
just to flirt with a luncheon a devilish bad trick as it takes off the bloom of one's appetite dick to the passage day what ye call it day panoramas we quicken our pace and there heartily cram as seducing young pates as ever could cozen one out of one's appetite down by the dozen we vary of course petty pates do one day the next we've our lunch with the gaufriers hollandaise that popular artist who brings out like scott his delightful production so quick hot and hot not the worst for the exquisite comment that follows divine maraschino which lord how one swallows end of poem extracts from mr fudge's journal addressed to lord c august tenth went to the madhouse saw the man who thinks poor wretch that while the fiend of discord here full riot ran he like the rest was guillotined but that when under boney's reign a more discreet though quite a strong one the heads were all restored again he in the scramble got a wrong one accordingly he still cries out this strange head fits him most unpleasantly and always runs poor devil about inquiring for his own incessantly while to his case a tear i dropped and sauntered home thought i ye gods how many heads might thus be swapped and after all not make much odds for instance there's van sittart's head tam carum it may well be said if by some curious chance it came to settle on bill soames's shoulders the effect would turn out much the same on all respectable cash holders except that while in its new socket the head was planning schemes to win a zigzag way into one's pocket the hands would plunge directly in good viscount sidmouth too instead of his own grave respected head for aught i see that bars old lady wilhelmina frumps so while the hand signed circulars the head might lisp out what is trumps the regent's brains could we transfer to some robust man milliner the shop the shears the lace and ribbon would go i doubt not quite as glib on and vice versa take the pains to give the prince the shopman's brains one only change from thence would flow ribbons would not be wasted so twas thus i pondered on my lord and even at night when laid in bed i found myself before i snored thus chopping swapping head for head at length i thought fantastic elf how such a change would suit myself twixt sleep and waking one by one with various pericranium saddled at last i tried your lordships on and then i grew completely addled forgot all other heads odd rotten and slept and dreamt that i was bottom end of poem this recording is in the public domain section eighteen from satirical and humorous poems part three fables for the Hody alliance by thomas moore read for librivox dot org by noel badrian the dissolution of the holy alliance a dream i've had a dream that bodes no good unto the holy brotherhood i may be wrong but i confess as far as it is right or lawful for one no conjurer to guess it seems to me extremely awful methought upon the neva's flood a beautiful ice palace stood a dome of frost-work on the plan of that once built by empress anne which shone by moonlight as the tale is like an aurora borealis in this said palace 
furnished all and lighted as the best on land are i dreamt there was a splendid ball given by the emperor alexander to entertain with all due zeal those holy gentlemen who've shown a regard so kind for europe's wheel at tropau laybach and verona the thought was happy and designed to hint how thus the human mind may like the stream imprisoned there be checked and chilled till it can bear the heaviest kings that ode or sonnet ere yet be praised to dance upon it and all were pleased and cold and stately shivering in grand illumination admired the superstructure greatly nor gave one thought to the foundation much too the Tsar himself exulted to all plebeian fears a stranger for madame crudener when consulted had pledged her word there was no danger so on he capered fearless quite thinking himself extremely clever and waltzed away with all his might as if the frost would last for ever just fancy how a bard like me who reverence monarchs must have trembled to see that goodly company at such a ticklish sport assembled nor were the fears that thus astounded my loyal soul at all unfounded for lo ere long those walls so massy were seized with an ill omen dripping and o'er the floors now growing glassy their holinesses took to slipping the Tsar, half through a polonaise could scarce get on for downright stumbling and prussia though to slippery ways well used was cursedly near tumbling yet still twas who could stamp the floor most russia and austria's mong the foremost and now to an italian air this precious brace would hand in hand go now while old louis from his chair entreated them his toes to spare called loudly out for a fandango and a fandango faith they had at which they all set to like mad never were kings though small the expenses of wit among their excellencies so out of all their princely senses but ah that dance that spanish dance scarce was the luckless strain begun when glaring red as twere a glance shot from an angry southern sun a light through all the chambers flamed astonishing old father frost who bursting into tears exclaimed a thaw by jove we're lost we're lost run france a second waterloo is come to drown you sauve qui peut end of poem the fly and the bullock the wise men of egypt were secret as dummies and even when they most condescended to teach they packed up their meaning as they did their mummies in so many wrappers twas out of one's reach they were also good people much given to kings fond of craft and of crocodiles monkeys and mystery but blue-bottle flies were their best beloved things as will partly appear in this very short history a scythian philosopher nephew they say to that other great traveller young anacarsis stepped into a temple at memphis one day to have a short peep at their mystical farces he saw a brisk blue bottle fly on an altar made much of and worshipped as something divine while a large handsome bullock led there in a halter before it lay stabbed at the foot of the shrine surprised at such doings he whispered his teacher if tisn't impertinent may i ask why should a bullock that useful and powerful creature be thus offered up to a blue-bottle fly no wonder said t'other you stare at the sight but we as a symbol of monarchy view it that fly on the shrine is legitimate right and that bullock the people that sacrificed to it End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 19 From Satirical and Humorous Poems, Part 4 By Thomas Moore Read for LibriVox.org By Noel Badrian Rhymes on the Road Extract 9 The English Tourist Venice and is there no earthly place where we can rest in dream elysian without some cursed round english face popping up near to break the vision mid northern lakes mid southern vines unholy sits we're doomed to meet for highest alps nor apennines are sacred from treadneedle street if up the simplon's path we wind fancying we leave this world behind such pleasant sounds salute one's ear as badish news from change my dear the funds phew curse this ugly hill are lowering fast what higher still and zooks we're mounting up to heaven we'll soon be down to sixty-seven go where we may rest where we will eternal london haunts us still the trash of almax or fleet ditch and scarce a pin's head difference which mixes though even to greece we run with every rill from helicon and if this rage for levelling lasts if cockneys of all sects and castes old maidens aldermen and squires will leave their puddings and cold fires to gape at things in foreign lands no soul among them understands if blues desert their coteries to show off mong the wahhabis if neither sex nor age controls nor fear of mamelukes forbids young ladies with pink parasols to glide among the pyramids why then farewell all hope to find a spot that's free from london kind who knows if to the west we roam but we may find some blue at home among the blacks of carolina or flying to the eastward sea some mrs hopkins taking tea and toast upon the wall of china end of poem a speculation of all speculations the market holds forth the best that i know for a lover of pelf is to buy marcus up at the price he is worth and then sell him at that which he sets on himself end of poem a joke versified come come said tom's father at your time of life there's no longer excuse for thus playing the rake it is time you should think boy of taking a wife why so it is father whose wife shall i take end of poem lines on the departure of lords castlereagh and stuart for the continent at paris a frat e qui rapuere sabilis vix tenure manus scis hoc menele nefandes ovid metamorphosis book thirteen verse two hundred and two go brothers in wisdom go bright pair of peers and may cupid and fame fan you both with their pinions the one the best lover we have of his years and the other prime statesman of britain's dominions go hero of chancery blessed with the smile of the misses that love and the monarchs that prize thee forget mrs angelo taylor awhile and all tailors but him who so well dandifies thee never mind how thy juniors in gallantry scoff never heed how perverse affidavits may thwart thee but show the young misses thou scholar enough to translate amour fortis a love about forty and sure tis no wonder when fresh as young mars from the battle you came with the orders you'd earned in it that sweet lady fanny should cry out my stars and forget that the moon too was some way concerned in it for not the great regent himself has endured 
though i've seen him with badges and orders all shine till he looked like a house that was over insured a much heavier burden of glories than thine and tis plain when a wealthy young lady so mad is or any young lady can so go astray as to marry old dandies that might be their daddies the stars are in fault my lord stuart not they thou too t'other brother thou tully of tories thou malaprop cicero over whose lips such a smooth rigmarole about monarchs and glories and knowledge and features like syllabub slips go haste at the congress pursue thy vocation of adding fresh sums to this national debt of ours leaguing with kings who for mere recreation break promises fast as your lordships break metaphors fare ye well fare ye well bright pair of peers and may cupid and fame fan you both with their pinions the one the best lover we have of his years and the other prime statesman of britain's dominions end of poem to sir hudson low effare causam nominis utrume mores hoc tui nomen dedere ad nomen hoc secuta morum regula olsonius eighteen sixteen sir hudson low sir hudson low by name and ah by nature so as thou art fond of persecutions perhaps thou'd read or heard repeated how captain gulliver was treated when thrown among the lilliputians they tied him down these little men did and having valiantly ascended upon the mighty man's protuberance they did so strut upon my soul it may have been extremely droll to see their pygmy pride's exuberance and how the doughty mannequins amused themselves with sticking pins and needles in the great man's breeches and how some very little things that pass for lords on scaffoldings got up and worried him with speeches alas alas that it should happen to mighty men to be caught napping though different to these persecutions for gulliver there took the nap while here the nap oh sad mishap is taken by the lilliputians end of poem ballad for the cambridge election i authorized my committee to take the step which they did of proposing a fair comparison of strength upon the understanding that whichever of the two should prove to be the weakest should give way to the other extract from mr w j banks's letter to mr gouldborn banks is weak and gouldborn too no one ere the fact denied which is weakest of the two cambridge can alone decide choose between them cambridge pray which is weakest cambridge say gouldborn of the pope afraid is banks as much afraid as he never yet did two old ladies on this point so well agree choose between them cambridge pray which is weakest cambridge say each a different mode pursues each the same conclusion reaches banks is foolish in reviews gulborn foolish in his speeches choose between them cambridge pray which is weakest cambridge say each a different foe doth damn when his own affairs have gone ill banks he damneth buckingham gulborn damneth dan o'connell choose between them cambridge pray which is weakest cambridge say once we know a horse's neigh fixed the election to a throne so whichever first shall bray choose him cambridge for thy own choose him choose him by his bray thus elect him cambridge pray june eighteen twenty six end of poem news for country cousins eighteen twenty six 
dear cuz as i know neither you nor miss draper when parliament's up ever take in a paper but trust for your news to such stray odds and ends as you chance to pick up from political friends being one of this well-informed class i sit down to transmit you the last newest news that's in town as to greece and lord cochrane things couldn't look better his lordship who promises now to fight faster has just taken roads and dispatched off a letter to daniel o'connell to make him grand master engaging to change the old name if he can from the knights of st john to the knights of st dan or if dan should prefer as a still better whim being made the colossus tis all one to him from russia the last accounts are that the Tsar, most generous and kind as all sovereigns are and whose first princely act as you know i suppose was to give away all his late brother's old clothes is now busy collecting with brotherly care the late emperor's nightcaps and thinks of bestowing one nightcap apiece if he has them to spare on all the distinguished old ladies now going while i write and arrival from riga the brothers having nightcaps on board for lord eldon and others last advices from india sir archie tis thought was near catching a tartar the first ever caught in north latitude twenty one and his highness burmese being very hard pressed to shell out the rupees and not having rhino sufficient they say meant to pawn his august golden foot for the payment how lucky for monarchs that thus when they choose can establish a running account with the jews the security being what rothschild calls good a loan will be shortly of course set on foot the parties are rothschild a baring and co with three other great pawnbrokers each takes a toe and engages lest goldfoot should give us leg bail as he did once before to pay down on the nail this is all for the present what vile pens and paper yours truly dear cousin best love to miss draper september eighteen twenty six end of poem a vision by the author of christabel up said the spirit and ere i could pray one hasty horizon whirled me away to a limbo lying i wist not where above or below in earth or air for it glimmered o'er with a doubtful light one couldn't say whether twas day or night and twas crossed by many a mazy track one didn't know how to get on or back and i felt like a needle that's going astray with its one eye out through a bundle of hay when the spirit he grinned and whispered to me thou'rt now in the court of chancery around me flitted unnumbered swarms of shapeless bodiless tailless forms like bottled up babes that grace the room of that worthy knight sir everard home all of them things half killed in rearing some were lame some wanted hearing some had through half a century run though they hadn't a leg to stand upon others more merry as just beginning around on a point of law were spinning or balanced aloft twixt bill and answer lead at each end like a tight-rope dancer some were so cross that nothing could please em some gulfed down affidavits to ease em all were in motion yet never a one let it move as it might could ever move on these said the spirit you plainly see are what they call suits in chancery i heard a loud screaming of old and young like a chorus by fifty velutes sung or an irish dump the words by more at an amateur concert screamed in score so harsh on my ear that wailing fell of the wretches who in this limbo dwell it seemed like the dismal symphony of the shapes aeneas in hell did see or those frogs whose legs a barbarous cook cut off and left the frogs in the brook to cry all night 
till life's last dregs give us our legs give us our legs touched with the sad and sorrowful scene i asked what all this yell might mean when the spirit replied with a grin of glee tis the cry of the suitors in chancery i looked and i saw a wizard rise with a wig like a cloud before men's eyes in his aged hand he held a wand wherewith he beckoned his embryo band and they moved and moved as he waved it o'er but they never got on one inch the more and still they kept limping to and fro like aerials round old prospero saying dear master let us go but still old prospero answered no and i heard the while that wizard elf muttering muttering spells to himself while o'er as many old papers he turned as hume ear moved for or omar burned he talked of his virtue though some less nice he owned with a sigh preferred his vice and he said i think i doubt i hope called god to witness and damned the pope with many more slates of tongue and hand i couldn't for the soul of me understand amazed and posed i was just about to ask his name when the screams without the merciless clack of the imps within and that conjurer's mutterings made such a din that startled i woke leapt up in my bed found the spirit the imps and the conjurer fled and blessed my stars right pleased to see that i wasn't as yet in chancery end of poem ode to ferdinand quit the sword thou king of men grasp the needle once again making petticoats is far safer sport than making war trimming is a better thing than being trimmed o king grasp the needle bright with which thou didst for the virgin stitch garment such as never before monarch stitched or virgin wore not for her o seamster nimble do i now invoke thy thimble not for her thy wanted aid is but for certain grave old ladies who now sit in england's cabinet waiting to be clothed in tabinet or whatever choice a tough is fit for dowagers in office first thy care o king devote to dame eldon's petticoat make it of that silk whose dye shifts for ever to the eye just as if it hardly knew whether to be pink or blue or material fitter yet if thou couldst a remnant get of that stuff with which of old sage penelope we are told still by doing and undoing kept her suitors always wooing that's the stuff which i pronounce is fittest for dame eldon's flounces after this we'll try thy hand mantua making ferdinand for old goody westmoreland one who loves like mother cole church and state with all her soul and has passed her life in frolics worthy of your apostolics choose in dressing this old flirt something that won't show the dirt as from habit every minute goody westmoreland is in it this is all i now shall ask hie thee monarch to thy task finish eldon's frills and borders then return for further orders o oh, what progress for our sake kings in millinery make ribbons garters and such things are supplied by other kings ferdinand his rank denotes by providing petticoats end of poem speech on the umbrella question by lord eldon vos innumerals video ex juvenil georgii canningi eighteen twenty seven my lords i'm accused of a trick that god knows is the last into which at my age i could fall of leading this grave house of peers by their noses wherever i choose princes bishops and all 
my lords on the question before us at present no doubt i shall hear tis that cursed old fellow that bugbear of all that is liberal and pleasant who won't let the lords give the man his umbrella god forbid that your lordships should knuckle to me i am ancient but were i as old as king priam not much i confess to your credit twould be to mind such a twaddling old trojan as i am i own of our protestant laws i am jealous and long as god spares me will always maintain that once having taken men's rights or umbrellas we ne'er should consent to restore them again what security have you ye bishops and peers if thus you give back mr bell's parapluie that he mayn't with its stick come about all your ears and then where would your protestant periwigs be no heaven be my judge were i dying to-day ere i dropped in the grave like a meddler that's mellow for god's sake at that awful moment i'd say for god's sake don't give mr bell his umbrella end of poem this recording is in the public domain section twenty from satirical and humorous poems part five by thomas moore read for librivox dot org by noel badrian thoughts on the present government of ireland eighteen twenty eight oft have i seen in gay equestrian pride some well-rouged youth round astley's circus ride two stately steeds standing with graceful straddle like him of rhodes with foot on either saddle while to soft tunes some jigs and some andantes he steers around his light-paced rosinantes so rides along with canter smooth and pleasant that horseman bold lord anglesey at present papist and protestant the coursers twain that lend their necks to his impartial reign and round the ring each honoured as they go with equal pressure from his gracious toe to the old medley tune half patrick's day and half boyne water take their cantering way while peel the showman in the middle cracks his long-lashed whip to cheer the doubtful hacks ah ticklish trial of equestrian art how blest if neither steed would bolt or start if protestants old restive tricks were gone and papists winkers could be still kept on but no false hopes not even the great duke row twixt two such steeds could scrape and overthrow if solar hacks played phaeton a trick what hope alas from hackney's lunatic if once my lord his graceful balance loses or fails to keep each foot where each horse chooses if peel but gives one extra touch of whip to papist's tail or protestant's ear-tip that instant ends their glorious horsemanship off bolt the severed steeds for mischief free and down between them plumps lord anglesey End of poem. Ode to the Woods and Forests by One of the Board, 1828. Let other bards to groves repair, where linnets strain their tuneful throats. Mine be the woods and forests where the treasury pours its sweeter notes. No whispering winds have charms for me, nor zephyr's balmy sighs I ask. To raise the wind for royalty, be all our sylvan zephyr's task. Instead of crystal brooks and floods, and all such vulgar irritation, let Gallic rhino through our woods divert its course of liquidation. Ah, surely Virgil knew full well what woods and forests ought to be, when sly he introduced in hell his guinea plant his bouillon tree nor see i why some future day when short of cash we should not send our herries down he knows the way to see if woods in hell will lend 
long may ye flourish sylvan haunts beneath whose branches of expense our gracious king gets all he wants except a little taste and sense long in our golden shade reclined like him of fair armida's bowers may wellington some wood nymph find to cheer his dothenth lustrum's hours to rest from toil the great untaught and soothe the pangs his warlike brain must suffer when unused to thought it tries to think and tries in vain o oh, long may woods and forests be preserved in all their teeming graces to shelter tory bards like me who take delight in sylvan places End of poem stanzas from the banks of the shannon 1828 take back the virgin page moore's irish melodies no longer dear vesey feel hurt and uneasy at hearing it said by thy treasury brother that thou art a sheet of blank paper my vesey and he the dear innocent placeman another for lo what a service we irish have done thee thou now art a sheet of blank paper no more by st patrick we've scrawled such a lesson upon thee as never was scrawled upon foolscap before come on with your spectacles noble lord duke or o'connell has green ones he haply would lend you read v c all o'er as you can't read a book and improve by the lesson we bog trotters send you a lesson in large roman characters traced whose awful impressions from you and your kin of blank-sheeted statesmen will ne'er be effaced unless stead of paper your mere ass's skin shall i help you to construe it ay by the gods could i risk a translation you should have a rare one but pen against sabre is desperate odds and you my lord duke as you hinted once wear one again and again i say read v c o'er you will find him worth all the old scrolls of papyrus that egypt ere filled with nonsensical law or the learned champollion ere wrote of to tire us all blank as he was we returned him on hand scribbled o'er with a warning to princes and dukes whose plain simple drift if they won't understand though caressed at st james's they're fit for st luke's talk of leaves of the sibyls more meaning conveyed is in one single leaf such as now we have spelled on that ear hath been uttered by all the old ladies that ever yet spoke from the sibyls to eldon end of poem irish antiquities according to some learned opinions the irish once were carthaginians but trusting to more late descriptions i'd rather say they were egyptians my reason's this the priests of isis when forth they marched in long array employed amongst other grave devices a sacred ass to lead the way and still the antiquarian traces mong irish lords this pagan plan for still in all religious cases they put lord roden in the van End of poem. resolutions passed at a late meeting of reverends and right reverends resolved to stick to every particle of every creed and every article reforming naught or great or little we'll staunchly stand by every tittle and scorn the swallow of that soul which cannot boldly bolt the whole resolved that though saint athanasius in damning souls is rather spacious though wide and far his curses fall our church hath stomach for them all and those who are not content with such may e'en be damned ten times as much resolved such liberal souls are we though hating nonconformity we yet believe the cash no worse is that comes from nonconformist purses 
indifferent whence the money reaches the pockets of our reverend breeches to us the jumper's jingling penny chinks with a tone as sweet as any and even our old friends yea and nay may through the nose for ever pray if also through the nose they'll pay resolved that hooper latimer and cranmer all extremely err in taking such a low-bred view of what lords spiritual ought to do all owing to the fact poor men that mother church was modest then nor knew what golden eggs her goose the public would in time produce one pishgar peep at modern durham to far more lordly thoughts would stir em resolved that when we spiritual lords whose income just enough affords to keep our spiritual lordships cosy are told by antiquarians prosy how ancient bishops cut up theirs giving the poor the largest shares our answer is in one short word we think it pious but absurd those good men made the world their debtor but we the church reformed no better and taking all that all can pay balance the accounts the other way resolved our thanks profoundly due are to last month's quarterly reviewer who proves by arguments so clear one sees how much he holds per year that england's church though out of date must still be left to lie in state as dead as rotten and as grand as the mummy of king osmiandas all pickled snug the brains drawn out with costly cerements swathed about and touch me not those words terrific scrawled o'er her in good hieroglyphic End of poem. Proposals for a Gynecocracy Addressed to a late radical meeting Quas ipsa decus sibi dia camilla De legit pacisque bonas bellique ministras Virgil As Whig reform has had its range And none of us are yet content Suppose, my friends, by way of change We try a female parliament and since of late with he mps we've fared so badly take to she's petticoat patriots flounced john russell's burdettes in blonde and broughams in bustles the plan is startling i confess but tis an affair of dress nor see i much there is to choose twixt ladies so they are thoroughbred ones in ribbons of all sorts of hues or lords in only blue or red ones at least the fiddlers will be winners whatever other trade advances as then instead of cabinet dinners we'll have at almax cabinet dances nor let this world's important questions depend on ministers digestions if Uday's receipts have done things ill, to Wipert's band they may go better. There's Lady X in one quadrille, would settle Europe if you'd let her. And who the deuce or asks or cares, when Whigs or Tories have undone em, whether they've danced through state affairs, or simply, duly, dined upon em. Hurrah then for the petticoats, to them we pledge our free-born votes, we'll have all she and only she pert blues shall act as best debaters old dowagers our bishops be and termagannets our agitators if vestress to oblige the nation her own olympus will abandon and help to prop the administration i can't have better legs to stand on the famed macaulay miss shall show each evening forth in learned oration shall move midst general cries of o oh, for full returns of population and finally to crown the whole the princess olive royal soul shall from her bower in banco regis descend to bless her faithful lieges and mid our union's loyal chorus reign jollily for ever o'er us end of poem the consultation
when they do agree their unanimity is wonderful the critic eighteen thirty three scene discovers dr wig and dr tory in consultation patient on the floor between them dr wig this wild irish patient does pester me so that what to do with him i'm cursed if i know i've promised him anodynes dr tory anodynes stuff tie him down gag him well he'll be tranquil enough that's my mode of practice dr wig true quite in your line but unluckily not much till lately in mine tis so painful dr tory pooh nonsense ask ude how he feels when for epicure feasts he prepares his live eels by flinging em in twixt the bars of the fire and letting them wriggle on till they tire he too says tis painful quite makes his heart bleed but your eels are a vile oleaginous breed he would fain use them gently but cookery says no and in short eels were born to be treated just so tis the same with these irish who odder fish still your tender wig heart shrinks from using them ill i myself in my youth ere i came to get wise used at some operations to blush to the eyes but in fact my dear brother if i may make bold to style you as peachum did lock it of old we doctors must act with the firmness of you day and indifferent like him so the fish is but stewed must torture live pats for the general good here patient groans and kicks a little dr wig but what if one's patient's so devilish perverse that he won't be thus tortured dr tory coerce sir coerce you're a juvenile performer but once you begin you can't think how fast you may train your hand in and smiling who knows but old tory may take to the shelf with the comforting thought that in place and in pelf he's succeeded by one just as bad as himself dr wig looking flattered why to tell you the truth i've a small matter here which you helped me to make for my patient last year goes to a cupboard and brings out a straight waistcoat and gag and such rest i've enjoyed from his raving since then that i've made up my mind he shall wear it again dr tory embracing him oh charming my dear dr wig you're a treasure next to torturing myself to help you is a pleasure assisting dr wig give me leave i've some practice in these mad machines there tighter the gag in the mouth by all means delightful all snug not a squeak need you fear you may now put your anodynes off till next year scene closes end of poem paddy's metamorphosis eighteen thirty three about fifty years since in the days of our daddies that plan was commenced which the wise now applaud of shipping off ireland's most turbulent paddies as good raw materials for settlers abroad some west indian island whose name i forget was the region then chosen for this scheme so romantic and such the success the first colony met that a second soon after set sail o'er the atlantic behold them now safe at the long-looked-for shore sailing in between banks that the shannon might greet and thinking of friends whom but two years before they had sorrowed to lose but would soon again meet and hark from the shore a glad welcome there came arrah paddy from cork is it you my sweet boy while pat stood astounded to hear his own name thus hailed by black devils who capered for joy can it possibly be half amazement half doubt pat listens again rubs his eyes and looks steady then heaves a deep sigh and in horror yells out good lord only think black and curly already 
deceived by that well mimicked brogue in his ears pat reads his own doom in these wool-headed figures and thought what a climate in less than two years to turn a whole cargo of pats into niggers moral tis thus but alas by a marvel more true than is told in this rival of ovid's best stories your wigs when in office a short year or two by a lucis naturae all turn into tories and thus when i hear them strong measures advise ere the seats that they sit on have time to get steady i say while i listen with tears in my eyes good lord only think black and curly already End of poem. Epistle from Henry of Exeter to John of Tuam. Dear John, as I know, like our brother of London, you've sipped of all knowledge, both sacred and mundane. No doubt in some ancient Joe Miller you've read what Cato, that cunning old Roman, once said, that he ne'er saw two reverend soothsayers meet let it be where it might in the shrine or the street without wondering the rogues mid their solemn grimaces didn't burst out a laughing in each other's faces what cato then meant though tis so long ago even we in the present times pretty well know having soothsayers also who sooth to say john are no better in some points than those of days gone and a pair of whom meeting between you and me might laugh in their sleeves too all lawn though they be but this by the way my intention being chiefly in this my first letter to hint to you briefly that seeing how fond you of tuum must be while meum's at all times the main point with me we scarce could do better than form an alliance to set these sad anti-church times at defiance you john recollect being still to embark with no share in the firm but your title and mark or even should you feel in your grandeur inclined to call yourself pope why i shouldn't much mind while my church as usual holds fast by your tuum and every one else's to make it all suum thus allied i've no doubt we shall nicely agree as no twins can be liker in most points than we both specimens choice of that mixed sort of beast see revelations chapter thirteen verse one a political priest both mettlesome charges both brisk pamphleteers ripe and ready for all that sets men by the ears and i at least one who would scorn to stick longer by any given cause than i found it the stronger and who smooth in my turnings as if on a swivel when the tone ecclesiastic won't do try the civil in short not to bore you even jure divino we've the same cause in common john all but the rhino and that vulgar surplus whate'er it may be as you're not used to cash john you'd best leave to me and so without form as the postman won't tarry i'm dear jack of tuum yours exeter harry end of poem this recording is in the public domain section twenty one from miscellaneous poems by thomas moore Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian. On reading Lord Byron's Memoirs, Venice. Lord Byron's Memoirs written by himself. Reflections when about to read them. Let me a moment, ere with fear and hope of gloomy, glorious things, these leaves I ope as one in fairy tale to whom the key of some enchanter's secret halls is given doubts while he enters slowly tremblingly if he shall meet with shapes from hell or heaven 
let me a moment think what thousands live o'er the wide earth this instant who would give gladly whole sleepless nights to bend the brow over these precious leaves as i do now how all who know and where is he unknown to what far region have his songs not flown like saffon's birds speaking their master's name in every language syllabled by fame how all who felt the various spells combined within the circle of that master mind like spells derived from many a star and met together in some wondrous amulet would burn to know when first the light awoke in his young soul and if the gleams that broke from that aurora of his genius raised more pain or bliss in those on whom they blazed would love to trace the unfolding of that power which hath grown ampler grander every hour and feel in watching o'er his first advance as did the egyptian traveller when he stood by the young nile and fathomed with his lance the first small fountains of that mighty flood they too who mid the scornful thoughts that dwell in his rich fancy tinging all its streams as if the star of bitterness which fell on earth of old had touched them with its beams can track a spirit which though driven to hate from nature's hands came kind affectionate and which even now struck as it is with blight comes out at times in love's own native light how gladly all who've watched these struggling rays of a bright ruined spirit through his lays would here inquire as from his own frank lips what desolating grief what wrongs had driven that noble nature into cold eclipse like some fair orb that once a sun in heaven and born not only to surprise but cheer with warmth and lustre all within its sphere is now so quenched that of its grandeur lasts naught but the wide cold shadow which it casts eventful volume whatsoe'er the change of scene and clime the adventures bold and strange the griefs the frailties but too frankly told the loves the feuds thy pages may unfold if truth with half so prompt a hand unlocks his virtues as his failings we shall find the record there of friendships held like rocks and enmities like sun-touched snow resigned of fealty cherished without change or chill in those who served him young and serve him still of generous aid given with that noiseless art which wakes not pride to many a wounded heart of acts but no not from himself must aught of the bright features of his life be sought while they who caught the world like milton's cloud turn forth their silver lining on the crowd this gifted being wraps himself in night and keeping all that softens and adorns and gilds his social nature hid from sight turns but its darkness on a world he scorns End of poem. Lines on the death of Sheridan. Principibus placuisse viris. Horatio. Yes, grief will have way, but the last falling tear shall be mingled with deep execrations on those who could bask in that spirit's median career and yet leave it thus lonely and dark at its close whose vanity flew round him only while fed by the odour his fame in its summer-time gave whose vanity now with quick scent for the dead like the ghoul of the east comes to feed at his grave 
oh it sickens the heart to see bosoms so hollow and spirits so mean in the great and high-born to think what a long line of titles may follow the relics of him who died friendless and lorn how proud they can press to the funeral array of one whom they shunned in his sickness and sorrow how bailiffs may seize his last blanket to-day whose pall shall be held up by nobles to-morrow and thou too whose life a sick epicure's dream incoherent and gross even grosser had passed were it not for that cordial and soul-giving beam which his friendship and wit o'er thy nothingness cast no not for the wealth of the land that supplies thee with millions to heap upon foppery's shrine no not for the riches of all who despise thee though this would make europe's whole opulence mine would i suffer what even in the heart that thou hast all mean as it is must have consciously burned when the pittance which shame had wrung from thee at last and which found all his wants at an end was returned was this then the fate future ages will say when some names will live but in history's curse when truth will be heard and these lords of a day be forgotten as fools or remembered as worse was this then the fate of that high gifted man the pride of the palace the bower and the hall the orator dramatist minstrel who ran through each mode of the lyre and was master of all whose mind was an essence compounded with art from the finest and best of all other men's powers who ruled like a wizard the world of the heart and could call up its sunshine or bring down its showers whose humour as gay as the firefly's light played round every subject and shone as it played whose wit in the combat as gentle as bright near carried a heart stain away on its blade whose eloquence brightening whatever it tried whether reason or fancy the gay or the grave was as rapid as deep and as brilliant a tide as ever bore freedom aloft on its wave yes such was the man and so wretched his fate and thus sooner or later shall all have to grieve who waste their morn's dew in the beams of the great and expect twill return to refresh them at eve in the woods of the north there are insects that prey on the brain of the elk till his very last sigh o oh, genius thy patrons more cruel than they first feed on thy brains and then leave thee to die End of poem. Sir John Stevenson from Rhymes on the Road And still to lead our evening choir was he invoked, thy loved one's sire, he who, if aught of grace there be in the wild notes I write or sing, first smoothed their links of harmony and lent them charms they did not bring. He of the gentlest, simplest heart with whom employed in his sweetest art that art which gives this world of ours a notion how they speak in heaven i've passed more bright and charmed hours than all earth's wisdom could have given o oh, happy days o oh, early friends how life since then hath lost its flowers but yet though time some foliage rends the stem the friendship still is ours and long may it endure as green and fresh as it hath always been how i have wandered from my theme but where is he that could return to such cold subjects from a dream through which these best of feelings burn not all the works of science art or genius in this world are worth one genuine sigh that from the heart 
friendship or love draws freshly forth end of poem a remonstrance after a conversation with lord john russell in which he had intimated some idea of giving up all political pursuits what thou with thy genius thy youth and thy name thou born of a russell whose instinct to run the accustomed career of thy sires is the same as the eaglet's to soar with his eyes on the sun whose nobility comes to thee stamped with a seal far far more ennobling than monarch ere set with the blood of thy race offered up for the wheel of a nation that swears by that martyrdom yet shalt thou be faint-hearted and turn from the strife from the mighty arena where all that is grand and devoted and pure and adorning in life tis for high-thoughted spirits like thine to command oh no never dream it while good men despair between tyrants and traitors and timid men bow never think for an instant thy country can spare such a light from her darkening horizon as thou with a spirit as meek as the gentlest of those who in life's sunny valley lie sheltered and warm yet bold and heroic as ever yet rose to the top cliffs of fortune and breasted her storm with an ardour for liberty fresh as in youth it first kindles the bard and gives life to his lyre yet mellowed even now by the mildness of truth which tempers but chills not the patriot fire with an eloquence not like those rills from a height which sparkle and foam and in vapour are o'er but a current that works out its way into light through the filtering recesses of thought and of law thus gifted thou never canst sleep in the shade if the stirrings of genius the music of fame and the charms of thy cause have not power to persuade yet think how to freedom thou art pledged by thy name like the boughs of that laurel by delphi's decree set apart for the fane and its service divine so the branches that spring from the old russell tree are by liberty claimed for the use of her shrine end of poem my birthday my birthday what a different sound that word had in my youthful ears and how each time the day comes round less and less white its mark appears when first our scanty years are told it seems like pastime to grow old and as youth counts the shining links that time around him binds so fast pleased with the task he little thinks how hard that chain will press at last vain was the man and false as vain who said were he ordained to run his long career of life again he would do all that he had done ah tis not thus the voice that dwells in sober birthdays speaks to me for otherwise of time it tells lavished unwisely carelessly of counsel mocked of talents made haply for high and pure designs but oft like israel's incense laid upon unholy earthly shrines of nursing many a wrong desire of wandering after love too far and taking every meteor fire that crossed my pathway for his star all this it tells and could i trace the imperfect picture o'er again with power to add retouch efface the lights and shades and joy and pain how little of the past would stay how quickly all should melt away all but that freedom of the mind which hath been more than wealth to me those friendships in my boyhood twined and kept till now unchangingly and that dear home that saving ark where love's true light at last i've found cheering within 
when all grows dark and comfortless and stormy round end of poem to lady holland on napoleon's legacy of a snuff-box gift of the hero on his dying day to her whose pity watched for ever nigh oh could he see the proud the happy ray this relic lights up in her generous eye sighing he'd feel how easy tis to pay a friendship all his kingdoms could not buy paris july eighteen twenty one end of poem this recording is in the public domain section twenty two from odes of anacreon by thomas moore read for librivox dot org by noel badrian ode number eight i care not for the idle state of persia's king the rich the great i envy not the monarch's throne nor wish the treasured gold my own but oh be mine the rosy wreath its freshness o'er my brow to breathe be mine the rich perfumes that flow to cool and scent my locks of snow to-day i'll haste to quaff my wine as if to-morrow ne'er would shine but if to-morrow comes why then i'll haste to quaff my wine again and thus while all our days are bright nor time has dimmed their bloomy light let us the festal hours beguile with mantling cup and cordial smile and shed from each new bowl of wine the richest drop on bacchus's shrine for death may come with brow unpleasant may come when least we wish him present and beckon to the sable shore and grimly bid us drink no more End of poem ode number fourteen count me on the summer trees every leaf that courts the breeze count me on the foamy deep every wave that sinks to sleep then when you have numbered these billowy tides and leafy trees count me all the flames i prove all the gentle nymphs i love first of pure athenian maids sporting in their olive shades you may reckon just a score nay i'll grant you fifteen more in the famed corinthian grove where such countless wantons rove chains of beauties may be found chains by which my heart is bound there indeed are nymphs divine dangerous to a soul like mine many bloom in lesbos's isle many in ionia smile rhodes a pretty swarm can boast caria too contains a host some them all of brown and fair you may count two thousand there what you stare i pray you peace more i'll find before i cease have i told you all my flames mong the amorous syrian dames have i numbered every one glowing under egypt's sun or the nymphs who blushing sweet deck the shrines of love in crete where the gods with festal play hold eternal holiday still in clusters still remain gades warm desiring train still there lies a myriad more on the sable india's shore these and many far removed all are loving all are loved end of poem ode number thirty four o thou of all creation blest sweet insect that delightest to rest upon the wild wood's leafy tops to drink the dew that morning drops and chirp thy song with such a glee that happiest kings may envy thee 
whatever decks the velvet field whate'er the circling seasons yield whatever buds whatever blows for thee it buds for thee it grows nor yet art thou the peasant's fear to him thy friendly notes are dear for thou art mild as matin dew and still when summer's flowery hue begins to paint the bloomy plain we hear thy sweet prophetic strain thy sweet prophetic strain we hear and bless the notes and thee revere the muses love thy shrilly tone apollo calls thee all his own twas he who gave that voice to thee tis he who tunes thy minstrelsy unworn by ages dim decline the fadeless blooms of youth are thine melodious insect child of earth in wisdom mirthful wise in mirth exempt from every weak decay that withers vulgar frames away with not a drop of blood to stain the current of thy purer vein so blest an age is passed by thee thou seemest a little deity end of poem ode number fifty five while we invoke the wreathed spring resplendent rose to thee we'll sing whose breath perfumes the olympian bowers whose virgin blush of chastened dye enchants so much our mortal eye when pleasure's springtide season glows the graces love to wreathe the rose and venus in its fresh-blown leaves an emblem of herself perceives oft hath the poet's magic tongue the rose's fair luxuriance sung and long the muses heavenly maids have reared it in their tuneful shades when at the early glance of morn it sleeps upon the glittering thorn tis sweet to dare the tangled fence to cull the timid flower at thence and wipe with tender hand away the tear that on its blushes lay tis sweet to hold the infant stems yet dropping with aurora's gems and fresh inhale the spicy sighs that from the weeping buds arise when rebel reigns when mirth is high and bacchus beams in every eye our rosy fillets scent exhale and fill with balm the fainting gale there's naught in nature bright or gay where roses do not shed their ray when morning paints the orient skies her fingers burn with roseate dyes young nymphs betray the rose's hue o'er whitest arms it kindles through in cytherea's form it glows and mingles with the living snows the rose distills a healing balm the beating pulse of pain to calm preserves the cold inured clay and mocks the vestige of decay and when at length in pale decline its florid beauties fade and pine sweet as in youth its balmy breath diffuses odour even in death oh whence could such a plant have sprung listen for thus the tale is sung when humid from the silvery stream effusing beauty's warmest beam venus appeared in flushing hues mellowed by ocean's briny dews when in the starry courts above the pregnant brain of mighty jove disclosed the nymph of asia glance the nymph who shakes the martial lance then then in strange eventful hour the earth produced an infant flower which sprung in blushing glories dressed and wantoned o'er its parent breast the gods beheld this brilliant birth and hailed the rose the boon of earth with nectar drops a ruby tide the sweetly orient buds they dyed and bade them bloom the flowers divine of him who gave the glorious vine and bade them on the spangled thorn expand their bosoms to the morn end of poem
ode number sixty one youth's endearing charms are fled hoary locks deform my head bloomy graces dalliance gay all the flowers of life decay withering age begins to trace sad memorials o'er my face time has shed its sweetest bloom all the future must be gloom this it is that sets me sighing dreary is the thought of dying lone and dismal is the road down to pluto's dark abode and when once the journey's o'er ah we can return no more end of poem this recording is in the public domain section twenty three epigram by thomas moore read for librivox dot org by noel badrian epigram from the greek around the tomb o bard divine where soft thy hallowed brow reposes long may the deathless ivy twine and summer spread her waste of roses and there shall many a fount distill and many a rill refresh the flowers but wine shall be each purple rill and every fount be milky showers thus shade of him whom nature taught to tune his lyre and soul to pleasure who gave to love his tenderest thought who gave to love his fondest measure thus after death if shades can feel thou mayest from odours round thee streaming a pulse of past enjoyment steal and live again in blissful dreaming end of poem and end of poetry of thomas moore